Yeah, well. Okay, well, um, well, let's just start with the basics. Just, just tell us who you are, uh, where you are at the moment, but also what your job is and why are we talking today? Okay, uh, thank you very much. My name is um, uh, Ujua Gomo. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ujua Gomo. I am the executive director of Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action Prawa, which is um, a member center of the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. Um, today, um, <laughs> it's, it's indeed a day. I'm so happy as you may imagine. So I just got the news about the election um, of uh, my election into the uh, SPT, which is the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. So that's the news and, and that's what's happening today. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm smiling. <laughs> um, yes, and, and congratulations. I think it's, it's, a, it's a great, great thing that they've, they've chosen you. Um, can you just tell us though, for people who don't know too much about all this anti-torture work, what is the subcommittee for the prevention of torture? What does it do and why is that important? Uh, the UN Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, it's um, a mechanism of the United Nations uh, actually came to um, be established following the provision of the United Nations uh, Convention Against Torture, Cruelly Human and um, Human Treatment and Punishment, the optional protocol to that convention, uh, which many of us will know that it came into force in 2006. But the SPT um, was actually established around February, I think February 2007. It's a group of experts, about, actually 25 experts, and the job of the SPT is really to help uh, yeah, towards the issue around prevention of torture. And it does this strategically through two main approaches. So first is the issue of visiting member states, going to places uh, where people's liberty have been deprived, places of detention. And um, the other bit is about advising, advising. So it advises member states in terms of the establishment of the national preventive mechanisms. It also advises the national preventive mechanisms and member states in terms of even the workings of, of the NPMs, the, which is the national preventive mechanism. Yeah. And um, also for people who don't know too much, what, what are the national preventive mechanisms that you just mentioned? Yeah, you know, um, so first, one of the major things that actually, that actually contained in that optional protocol, remember I mentioned the optional protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture, Cruelly Human and Degrading Treatment and Punishment, is the fact that member states were asked to establish national preventive mechanisms. So internally within each of these member states, we encourage you to set up a mechanism of oversight, a mechanism to ensure that they prevent torture. And this part of what this mechanism is supposed to be doing is visiting places of detention in that country, okay? So in some countries you have designated institution or a mech or a committee that, which is, um, that is actually doing this. In some other countries we have a different um, agencies doing that. So whether it's National Human Rights Commission or those, maybe those countries have established what is called uh, the National Committee on Prevention of Torture or whatever way they decide to name it. But the most important, what is important is that these countries, all members the countries are encouraged to set up this process which will enable them prevent torture. So it's, we are not just only talking about rehabilitating those people who have been tortured, and, and then who those who have survived torture, but we are saying we need to prevent. And the NPMs, uh, as I would keep referring to them here, which is basically is an acronym for National Preventive Mechanism, is there to enable member states to do that, to encourage, to support, to drive that process internally. So the SBT, on the other hand, it's actually there to help member states, help the NPMs to achieve those kind of things in, in compliance with the uh, provisions of the OPCAT. OPCAT, as again, as I said, is the optional protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture, Cruelly Human and Degrading Treatment or Punishment. And from your experience, you have quite unique experience with Prower. 
Um, if you can explain to us what Prower does and why would that be relevant to working on the okay. subcommittee for the prevention of torture? Oh, so thank you very much. Um, Prower's work um, actually um, does a lot in terms of engaging persons who are in places of detention, in prisons, uh, those persons um, who have been deprived of their liberty one way or the other, and who and we're doing this across um, in Nigeria, but also uh, doing some work in some of the other African countries. The approach that we use in terms of the work of power, which of course is about corrections, is about justice, is about security sector, and for chatting this whole notion of prevention of torture, but also rehabilitation of torture victims and survivors. That the major thing is that in, we have a multidisciplinary approach. So. Um, I personally, but not just me, but the organization looks at this intervention from a very holistic perspective. For my own side, I have both a health um, uh, background as well as a legal background. I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a clinical psychologist. Okay, so, but in terms of the work, when we, this is the question you asked about, what is it that Prawa is doing and how does my personal work uh, uh, going to help me? And I think it's, very in very many ways. So one, um, I have visited many places of detention, you know, in, in many countries. Um, I, I may say that I'm not even aware of anyone who has visited more, maybe I'm, I'm yet to see, but what that has done for me is that it have enabled me to understand the issues to look at when you go into prisons or other or police cells or other places of detention. It enables me to connect with both the access negotiation, but also the way to get the right information. I know how to decode the information even when you are doing, you are collecting this information from those persons who have been detained. But also be able to be sensitive to the issues that can come up even after a visit on places of detention. So the notion of confidentiality, but more than anything else, to be able to build the capacities of the people who you are with to let them understand the principles that they are supposed to follow, to let them understand the international standards that they are not supposed to violate, okay? So this ability to have been able to visit many places of detention in the several countries, uh, I believe will be something that will help a lot in terms of my new assignment. The second bit is the work of Prower also does very many constructive engagement with the government agencies. So I've come to realize that um, there are so many times you see violations happening, but may, sometimes these violations are happening because the state operators are not even aware. Yes, they may say ignorance of the law is no excuse, but it's also important to let people understand what these rules are, let them understand the principles. And, and also let them understand that it's not just a question of saying um, you can't do it. There's always a way to prevent torture. There is no reason to justify torture. In what you can't even say I'm tortured because we don't have the money to buy equipment. No. So the issue is to, in very creative ways, engage the government. So extensively, I've worked uh, both as power, but also in terms of my work, been exposed to a lot of work with the government institution. The Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019, for example, is one um, um, monumental achievement that uh, we, we helped happen in Nigeria. There is also different work that we've done with not just the Nigerian Correctional Service, but also the police in terms of training on human rights, but also Legal Aid Council, National Human Rights Commission, and also raising a lot of awareness about what needs to be done in Nigeria to prevent torture, okay? And also to rehabilitate those who have been tortured. So that's also part of um, the work that we've probably been doing. So, I believe that Dr. being Uju, able to... Um, oh, sorry. We just froze for a few seconds there. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see we, it. I don't know where um, did you stop. I don't know what, what I don't know what... what you said uh, the, the, the Correction, National Correction Act, Correctional Services Act, that, that was a big achievement. Um, yes. I'll, I'll just pick it up from there. I think, if could, could you sit back slightly a bit more? Because I think, yeah. Uh, and then, I, can you angle the screen down a bit more? Like this? Yes, there. Okay, that's that's very good. That's great. Um, so, are are you okay with that, or you want to repeat it? Because I didn't know it was frozen. Is that okay? Um, 
let's well we'll pick up from as you say that's a very concrete example of Pr Prower was pushing for reforms and there was a new piece of legislation a new act passed um but can you tell me from a like a personal perspective when you've done all these prison visits um can you tell me a story about how it's actually you know made an impact on on a prisoner's outcome you know on on someone's life the kind of story you would tell a friend about you know yeah. Okay. When you when you think back over all those visits you've made in prison, which is the one that really you remember the most, and 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 how does it illustrate? Yeah, I'm I'm actually many of many of many of them, but uh, one of the thing I found out was that uh, uh, once and first, it's not beyond just the prison. Even this is true for even police stations. Once somebody has been detained, and the authorities are aware that others are aware that this person has been detained. The chances of that person being killed extrajudicially is very minimal. So that enhances or rather emphasizes the importance of oversight, okay? So being able to understand that when people are in detention, when people are in police stations or prisons, they're completely out of the normal view. So there must be, and when you look at the balance of power, these people are very vulnerable. More so in countries where you have known that security agencies or um, you know have been have been abusing a lot of these rights, it becomes uh, a question of life and death. Your intervention can actually make a statement about once whether somebody can be alive or not. Okay, so I think that this shows that this mechanism is something that we should encourage. And, and that's why I'm so happy that it's not just about what happens at the SPT or the UN level, but it's also how member states are encouraged to take ownership of this process, to do something to reduce the incidences around this. So one of the thing I found that there was a particular facility that, was, that I visited with our team. And in this particular, uh, facility, this was in Nigeria. And I'll give you a couple of examples from the different corner, but this was in Nigeria. And I had gone in and I saw a gentleman and he was telling me that he has been very long, he stayed long in, in that particular facility. And I asked him how many years? And he told me, I said, I have stayed uh, this X number of years. And I, let me just give him, said, okay, I've stayed maybe about 11 years. He was a little bit, not too sure how many years, but what struck me was that when Prawa began to uh, use the case management system that we have we established for the state where that particular prison and prison in Nigeria, they are all called uh, custodial centers or correctional centers. In that particular state, there are four of those facilities. So you have four custodial centers in that facility, in that state, but three were facilities that were holding both awaiting trial persons as those people have not been convicted. Whilst one is like a, what is called a prison farm center and is only for convicted persons. But when we established, used that case management system and we did our analysis, you know, as assessment, we found out that this young man had been in custody awaiting trial for about 16 years. And he had given us some years far less. So for me, I'm like, do you mean that I can really be in this kind of a situation where I've completely, even today, in another country, somebody sent me a message. He said, I can't believe that I have been, and this is a political prisoner, and that's the, I can't believe that I have been in here for six years. So time is ticking, but this time, it's not just there as an ordinary number, but this time is ticking and affecting the lives of these people. You know, so a life, the quality of life affecting their relationship with their loved ones, affecting the impact that they could make in the in the country, but also think of it, even when many, some of these people are also political prisoners, you know, some of these people are also people who are innocent. Some of these people are also people who have committed offenses that are not such that you should put them in those states. So again, the position is, is that there is no justification for torture whatsoever, okay? So you are looking at this issue of life saving life and what that can mean. And I can go on and on and on. I've been in places where even the fact that you have, have somebody who has been tortured by the police and the police have brought the person to custodial center or the prisons, 
and being not able to respond immediately, you find a situation where that person will die because of the wound that they're coming out from that touch. You know, so these are life experiences and these are individual you know, lives. It's not just stories. And for me, the fact that you can put a smile on the face of someone is, is really important. But more than in this, it's not just about dealing with this particular victim, but what of those that we are not aware of? What of the future victims? So that's why the preventive work is so key. The preventive work is so key. In addition to the rehabilitation of torture victims, we must do all we can to make sure that nations comply with the provisions that we have both in terms of CAT and also in terms of the OPCAT. And of course, CAT, for those who don't know, is the UN Convention Against Torture, Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Why the OPCAT is the optional protocol to that same instrument. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very shocking story to, to meet meet a man who's been in there for 16 years and he, he wasn't he wasn't charged he wasn't put on trial can you tell me he was he was he was going to he was having trials but these were often you know adjourned so it wasn't that he wasn't going to court he was going to court there was a lot so there was also issues about the lawyer he couldn't afford to pay the lawyer there were all sorts of issues there were also all sorts of complications around that so when we intervened we also provided legal intervention but also dealt with issues about the psychological dimension to this but it's just to tell you so well, can you tell um, me what the what the yeah. impact of the intervention was? I mean, so so, so you found this person. What what, what did you do? And so, what, so for this changed? particular case, so one one thing that happened was then uh, because in in this particular and let me just mention the state. It was one state in, in Nigeria called Enugu State. So we got the Attorney General involved because apart from that, maybe we also had dealt with the issue of advocacy, so that it became not just a question of this particular gentleman, but also for the attorney general to not begin, because even the attorney general was so shocked that he had somebody who had stayed that long in his state without the trial being concluded, okay? So, and it also uh, began to make us um, share, the, because we did, there was a lot of stories around this. So the case management system began to also be adopted in some of the other states. And now there is a national um, uh, uh, project that had actually not been owned by the government itself, which is trying to ensure that uh, using statistics that, that at that time, everything will used to be manual. So, but it's, uh, uh, and you know, and being able to then say, let's use this and track the case. But we are still not at the point, which, which is really one of the other issues which we are advocating, that we need to have a centralized database of all places of detention, in reflecting all persons in detention and making it accessible to the national preventive mechanisms and to national human rights commission and all, and all the rest and you know civil society organization that can be of assistance because that's the only way you can be able to plan and be able to intervene and be able to provide or prevent um, a extrajudicial killing and in saying this for nigeria we have about 19 institutions that can detain people so it's not just about the correctional service or the prisons or the police you have so many other agencies but we do not have a centralized database. And we think it is, and, and this was also one of the cases, the issues that we raised in terms of the universal periodic review of Nigeria. And the one of the recommendations that was made to Nigeria um, by the UPR, well, uh, well uh, during the UPR, the last UPR um, review of Nigeria was asking Nigeria to set up this database. Okay, encouraging us to Nigeria to ensure that in all detention facilities that there are tamper-proof registers so that we know everybody who have come in and everybody who have gone out. And that database should be able to say, for example, this is the total number of persons who are in detention and this percentage of them are being kept in this facility on, or this by this agency and all that. And, and I think that that is something that we still need to, uh, that the country needs to, need to be encouraged to do along with all the countries. And, and let me also say, it is not just only Nigeria, in a lot of countries, uh, uh, especially in, in Africa, are uh, also not keeping this centralized database. So we need to encourage these member countries to be able to do this, you know, uh, because it yeah. will help. I think that's an essential planning. point. Yeah. 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 As you say, I mean, the chances of being tortured reduce massively once the mm -hmm. person is rec recognized as being in custody. It's the very old, it's, it's the oldest um, writ in English law, habeas corpus, you know, do you have a body? 
that was the very first sort of human right protection, you know, and that, and that was around sort of a thousand years ago in English law, because that was always recognized that mm -hmm. the person who's unknown to the court mm -hmm. could, could be tortured, killed um, with complete impunity. So it's very interesting. It's, you know, it's still the, the building block of a lot of work. Um, can I ask a little bit about your own personal background? Um, how did you come to be the founder of Prower? You know, uh, and and mixing <laughs> law, criminology, psychology. Okay. Um, it is a. <laughs> it's very interesting mix. I mean, a, I've got a little bit of a mixed background <laughs> myself. It is. <laughs> it is a very good question. Okay, so what happened in in Nigeria? We have this process, what we call the National Human uh, National Youth Service Corps. Yeah. Uh, NYSC, National Youth Service Corps enables every person, once you come out from university, you should serve the country for one year. So when I finished my uh, first degree, and then I had studied psychology at that time, I, I went to my attachment, the, the, my National Youth Service Corps for one year was served working with the police. So uh, while I was with the police, part of what I was supposed to be doing is to read all the newspapers. So I was attached to the police public relation officer office at that time. So I was to look, look at the newspapers and then um, identify anybody who is saying something negative about the police. So I will mark it and then I will draft the response and all the rest of that. But I found that, that literally every day there was so much negativity in the media about the police. So I then asked my um, con a commissioner of police then who was the commissioner of police and I doom of blessed memory. This was in a state called Undo State, and that's in the southwestern part of Nigeria. And I said, I want to have opportunity to tow all the units of the police. I want to know a little bit more. That's one. Secondly, I wanted to interview those people who were in the criminal investigation division, CID, because that's where every detainee is kept. So, but from that, I also decided that to be able to understand more, it's not just looking at the people who were in the CID cells, but also to look at people who were in the prisons. That was my first time of going into the prison. And uh, the my husband, by that time we weren't married, uh, he, I, I had just known him and as somebody who was working because he was then going to prisons a lot, he's a psychiatrist. And he said, this is a good research. And he, so we used to then move in to the, uh, police cells and the prison then to just collect this data on the social demographic characteristics of persons who were in detention. And I was shocked with the result. I just could not believe it. You know, the number of persons, the fact that there was people there who were saying they, weren't in, they were innocent, the fact there were people who um, were minor offenders, the fact there were young people mixed with, you know, I just could not believe it. So I realized that something needed to be done to assist these people. So from that interest began deepening. So I went then to do my clinical psychology a degree, went further to do my degree on deviant behavior, which was in sociology. And then I got, um, uh, I, I got the opportunity to go to Cambridge to study criminology at the University of Cambridge. When I got back, but when I was in Cambridge, I realized that really you can really have a platform that begin to address this issue. So I took interest. I took interest, I know, and then I came back to Nigeria and I be, and then I actually uh, set up the organization Prower and began to work in this um, area. But uh, some years into that, uh, I got a achievement scholarship to go to the UK and study law because I've always wanted to read law. And that's where how I got to study law, um, law, uh, criminology, sociology, deviant behavior, psychology, clinical psychology. So that's how the mixture has been. But in terms of professionalism, so that's how power started. So you, I then had had the opportunity to also um, serve. I used to be the, and maybe this is something that may interest you. Uh, I was appointed into the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria as one of the commissioners uh, some time ago. And where, when I got in there, um, every because we had the only this, uh, the uh, executive secretary of National Human Rights Commission, just as it is also today, is the full time staff. All the commissioners will come and then do meetings, and then we're supposed to decide on policy matters, and then they will leave. So it just struck me. I said, why don't we set up a rapporteur mechanism? So I did draft a, a, a memo to the uh, committee requesting for them to accept for the establishment of rapporteurs mechanism, which will be made headed 
the rapporteur will be one of the commissioner for the designated thematic area, but that a staff of the commission, of the National Human Rights Commission, should be as, assigned to assist the rapporteur, and they accepted it. Uh, and when we started as questioning what role, which particular designation, I was actually made the very first rapporteur for Nigeria on police, prisons, and centers of detention. And I did that for eight years. So from some of that experiences, we started realizing that you can actually make a incremental Im impact and improvement from one level to another, to another. So it's, it's, it's been that journey, you know, it's been that journey. Yeah, I'm also, well, inspired to talk to people in this movement because people like yourself and Vincent Jacopino and what, just many, many others have been talking to our centers in the Philippines this morning. You know, people just see the problem and then they create a, a position, a, you know, they create a, a new paradigm in this. You know, as you're saying, you created this role for sort of special rapporteur on prisons and then you did that job for eight years. It's kind of like Vince and, and the colleagues in Turkey seeing that there was no standards for actually documenting, investigating mm, torture and saying, well, mm -hmm. let's just make those standards then. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's another great example of, of the good work um we better get back to the um subcommittee haven't we i mean <clears throat> you probably know a lot about it before we say what you think you should you know the, the priorities should be perhaps you can tell me what you think the subcommittee has been doing well over the last decade of its existence and what it's been doing less well where has it been good and where has it been less good do you think <laughs> Okay, so first, uh, I will say to you, there's a lot around um, principles, standards, you know, you know, things like that. You know, and there's been quite a good handful of that coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also been some visit, you know, so some, uh, so there's some kind of awareness about this whole issue. So it's it's also there. Um, part of what I am thinking is that. Uh, the compliance level is becomes a little bit of a challenge. So um, the, the level of commitment um, of member states towards implementing the provisions, you know, very well, it has been also quite a challenge. So uh, I, and, and this for me uh, is something that needs to be looked at because you can really have a win-win situation here. Yeah? It doesn't matter what, um, what, what is the level of your country in terms of development, in terms of resources. Once you have the political will is possible. And, and I'll speak to this later because this is one of the things I'm thinking that I will be able to bring to the, you know, to the table. So the other part is that, you know, the law is important, but also we need a little bit more about the health base, you know, to also make sure that, that the, the marriage between the, legal component and the head bed component cannot be uh, ignored. And, and I, I, I just think that um, my perspective and my background brings a lot of that to bear. So that's one. So, um, so it's just more of tweaking this to ensure that countries don't look at these things as things that they sh is, is not achievable, as things they should not encourage. So that the level of cooperation between member state and SPT, and indeed by extension the UN, should be improved, a little bit improved more than what it is doing. And I do have some ideas about how this can, can happen. Great, well, well <clears throat> that's a perfect segue to the next question then. Give us your ideas, the priorities you have for making these changes in terms of cooperation, in terms of a refocusing on, on the health basis for Okay, so there are a couple of them, but just think this way. So I'm looking at, let's, if you look at a country that says, I don't have enough resources, you know, my challenge is that it's a resource issue. So there's a need to enhance the nature of engagement with these kinds of countries. So it becomes constructive uh, engagement, but it also begins more like letting the country know, because sometimes people say, you all see all the negatives. What are the things we are doing good? So I've known that even in the midst of what is being done bad, you can always articulate or see or identify 
these little milestones that seem like trickles of light that you can trigger and then use it to engage. So my point is that it has to be a very constructive engagement. I want to understand why, why are you failing? What aspect, what is that? And how can we help you through our advice and all that to go around what you think is not possible? The second part of it is what I think that we should begin to champion, what I actually call not just a whole of government support in terms of prevention of torture, but a whole of society's approach. What do I mean? That in terms of proof, pushing for a full implementation of the of cards, of the cards itself, and other relevant human rights in instrument, that we are asking the public sector to impute, the private sector to engage, and the voluntary sector. I believe that this is doable. So if these three dynamics work, it will go a long way. So that people see it as there must be something their own sector can contribute into this. And once you do it, it becomes easier for some nations who ordinarily would be difficult for them to bear it in, on their own to be able to address this. The third point is that this whole notion of non-custodial mission, the non-custodial, which is community corrections, because there really seem to be a, a, a obsession in terms of overutilization of imprisonment. You know, it's not has not been working, it's been expensive, and so many others. So I want to then begin to encourage us to look at how to project you know, the use of non-custodial as a mechanism for addressing prevention of torture, promoting prevention of torture through the use of non-custodial measures, which of course, a lot of countries will find very, very helpful. I also want us to look at this whole notion of peer review mechanisms. You know, sometimes the fact that you can sit with your peers and say, you know, this is where I have a problem. And this one can tell you, okay, you know what, this is what we did in my country, how we address it, can bring a lot of value. So we, I think that that space to encourage more of that, and when I talk about peer review, I make this, I'm not talking a lot only about the high and the mighty in the government. I'm also talking about the professionals, yeah? The correctional officers, those man in different detention facilities, the health workers, the psychologists, the lawyers, and all that. Those who are the key critical stakeholders who are working in that space to see what others have done to help. Where are the good practices that they can begin to build on? So the whole notion of really ensuring that guidance and technical assistance is you know, really emphasized for those who required will also be something that I know that some people are already, some, some work are already on this area. So uh, if you, you ask me maybe in a one sentence, it's like ensuring um, an expansion of the countries who are able to comply with the provisions. And that is by also seeing what can be done from their own perspective. So it's not like putting down anybody. It's like constructively engaging, carrying along, encouraging, and ensuring that we get to that full um, uh, uh, compliance level, which I think that we should actually aspire to um, uh, uh, for all member states. Yeah, really good, really good um, priorities. And I guess you just, but to achieve those kind of things, you just need a certain force of personality, I'd imagine. I mean, trying to get whole society buy-in on, uh, you know, torture prevention and and having states. I mean, in your in your own experience in in Nigeria, I can't imagine how you get Nigerian officials, Nigerian police and army to say, "Oh, you know, maybe you're right. We we won't uh, no, but beat the crap out of this Boko Haram no, I have suspect." Done, I have actually I have actually done some of those. Yeah. I have had sessions with the police, with the military. I do a lot of trainings on human rights for them. And I've seen instances where I've finished sessions and some of them were breaking down, you know, like the, you will see literally how they feel this is certainly not something to continue in terms of what they've been doing. And making them champions. In short, there was a particular one program we'd finished and many of them were that talk, talk to, to call them ambassadors or human rights ambassadors. These are officers and they were wearing badges. Each other, one asked us to go and you know um, get these badges. And each of them, as they were being given their certificate at human rights ambassadors. Can you, can you imagine? So my point is that once you emphasize this 
And the question is that if you give the message to another, then you keep on multiplying the number of persons who know about it. And it is not rocket science. All we are saying is that, yes, we have a problem that we need to be addressed. Then can everyone, in one whatever way they can, within their sphere of influence, make their contribution? That's all we're saying. Because if you leave it for one second, it becomes overwhelming. And then it can tell you, we don't have funds. We don't have any. But if everybody does whatever they can within their own sphere of influence, then something can give way. We can, even the doctors, the, the psychologists, the lawyers in the country can also be engaged. I mean, we had a project in Prow that was called Torture Documentation and Redress Scheme. And we had lawyers and doctors. You can't believe it that some of the doctors that participated in that scheme have become our volunteers. Now, when the police bring people who are tortured, they know what to do, they know the numbers to, to phone. Before that, they, just, they weren't doing anything. So here is making everyone part of this work. Yeah, and I, and I think it's possible. Amen to that. That's, that's fantastic, Dr. Uju. Um, yeah, I, I mean, from my side, we've talked about everything I'd like to at the moment. I mean, to, to sort of, to follow up on all, some of these things, um, I'm very interested in the work you're, you're doing with Asker and James on the, the um, national councils, looking at all the evidence that, that have come out from the end of SARS and, you know, and the, the role of the councils in reparation and, and um, you know, all of that work. Uh, as I understand it, IRCT will be making a report with Prower about yes, that. Yes, and, the, and yeah. the National Human Rights Commission. Yes. And the National Human Rights Commission, yes, right. Yes. Great. It's well, the perhaps, support in the commission, yes. Yeah, perhaps we'll talk again at that point. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a really, really big. Yeah, and the, and basically the key thing is, how do you use what has happened to learn the lesson and stop what is going right. to happen tomorrow? That means just yeah. it's just being able to analyze what the data is telling you, so that we know what the problem, know more about the problem, the nature yeah. of the problem, and then be able to articulate what concrete intervention can help to stop this over a long, you know, more sustainable uh, process. Yeah. yeah. When you described, you know, these officers. You've, you've finished a session talking to them about, I suppose, about the the wrongness of torture and the health mm -hmm. impacts. And, you know, you, you said they've been weeping. Do you think that's because, they, you know, that it's it's a relief for them to actually have someone just tell them, yeah. you, you know, um, they know what they're doing is wrong. And yeah, it's some of them, I mean, it's not that all of it, it's not that we had yeah. a weeping class, you know, a class everywhere we were sweeping, some of them, um, shed tears, but the point was, and sure, there was also another thing we direct we use. We then had a, a session, like almost counseling in court or a debriefing session, is one to one. So when we finish the session, we divide the resource team into, um, you know, to have. So you have, if sometimes we have three, four, five, depending on how many we are, and then the officers will come one after the other, but they will choose who they go to speak to. So we had. Uh, as my members of our team, the de different some are men, some are women, to myself, and all that. Something so they would we would have session, and this for many of them was the first time ever anybody was hearing them. I mean, I had some will come and confess some of the things that they have done. Some will come and tell you how the structure um, it makes it more difficult for them to complete. You know, they would they will let you understand that these are the issues and these are the things they would like to start doing now today, tomorrow. So it becomes an attitudinal thing because at the end of the day, and I tell them, you will find the, you know, do you know that among them, they know who, is, who are the bad of the cop. They know the bad officers. They know. They know the officers who are violating and they also they know the good ones. There are also some good ones. It's also important to know that it's not that every police officer or every uh, mil uh, uh, um, um, military officer, every security officer. No, I have found that this is something we need to begin to speak more because what it does is it gives opportunity for introspection. Right, so. Yeah, it gives opportunity for, for them to, to reflect on what they have done, the implication of what they have done, why whatever it is that they've been using as justification or defending their action. So, and, but the idea is that, can you then go and tell others what we have told you, what you have learned, you know? So I think, I think that's 
an approach that we really we saw at some level so that it we and we believe that in that way you're not only addressing maybe lawyers psychologists psychiatrists doctors civil society organization and, and all that but you're also looking at the perpetrators and saying how can you begin to do something different yeah uh, from what you've been doing because there is really no justification there's no justification for torture. Yeah, I think that's so essential. It's um, it's actually on my sort of very long to-do list is actually start making some materials for sort of IRCT members ar around working with perpetrators because the focus is, of course, and rightly so on the survivors, but until perpetrators themselves learn more about torture and, and Give, give us interviews and break down and have a good cry about it in a, in a session with someone like yourself, then, you know, progress is always going to be limited because we're only mm -hmm. treating half the side of the equation. Right. Um, I, I can send you a, a, a film I made when I was a journalist in Syria about, okay. um, um, you know, a, a torture survivor who, you know, a grown up man, a young boy who was a child when he was tortured and a perpetrator and they were all living in the same village just across the border in Lebanon they'd all fled um, but it was it was interviewing the perpetrator that was the most devastating I think because mm. you know the mindset of those yeah, yeah. Syrian army officials um, yeah how, you know how they can just torture children to death mm. was, was quite, uh, quite quite horrible um yeah. well I think we've 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 covered a lot of really, really okay. interesting points there. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll put the interview into our transcribing machine and make a script for some social media posts just about the, um, the subcommittee appointment. But then there's lo lo loads of great material about Prowler's work. And then I'll use that um, for some future future mm. things and, and I'll, I'll email you with some ideas about what we can do thank you and have you seen some of the documentaries we made on torture do i for send it to your whatsapp because i've sent some people yeah yeah you see those documentaries yeah. did you yeah. see the short short bits there's some like five minutes three minutes did you see those yeah, yeah five of them. yeah okay yeah i would really like to, to take those and the thing is for, for twitter we need to make them down to two minutes so that mm. they can uh, they play or yeah, but I can send and um, then you can uh, reduce whatever if it yeah. helps. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah. We we yeah. did those um, earlier in the year, and that yeah. was yeah. part of what actually that was more like responding to Nigeria non, you know that you know the, the, what happened in eleven in November when they didn't submit their report. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, and, and now then they flew in. <laughs> If you need uh, to know now, they have been reporting, they, they've been meeting, you know, they, they are writing the award, the one they have to submit before December. So they, you know, but right, because right. we really put them on their toes here. Yeah. So yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. Okay. Okay. Well, congratulations no again, Dr. Uju. Thanks Thank for you. talking to me. I'll be in touch Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.